Act One of Life is a Dream by Pedro Calderon de la Barca, translated by Edward Fitzgerald, 1809-1883. to This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Basilio, King of Poland Read by Algy Pug Sigismund, son of King Basilio, read by Shakewell. Astolfo, his nephew, read by Matthew Rees. Estrella, Basilio's niece, read by Christine. Clotaldo, a general in Basilio's service, read by Alan Mapstone. Rosaura, a Muscovite lady, read by Avaii. Fife, her attendant, read by Son of the Exiles. The Chamberlain, read by Andrew James. Lord in Waiting, read by Todd. Captain, read by AMB Suite 13. Soldier 1, read by Todd. Soldier 2, read by Sonia. Stage Directions read by adrian stevens act one scene one a pass of rocks over which a storm is rolling away and the sun setting in the foreground halfway down a fortress enter first from the topmost rock rosora as from horseback in man's attire and after her fife there four-footed fury blast engendered brute without the wit of brute or mouth to match the bit of man art satisfied at last who when thunder rolled aloof toward the spheres of fire your ears pricking and the granite kicking into lightning with your hoof among the tempest shattered crags shattering your luckless rider back into the tempest past there then lie to starve and die or find another phaeton mad mettled as yourself for i wearied worried and foredone alone will down the mountain try that knits his brows against the sun five as to his mule there thou misbegotten thing long eared lightning tail tornado griffin hoof in hurricane i might swear till i were almost hoarse with roaring assonante who forsooth because our betters would begin to kick and fling you forthwith your noble mind must prove and kick me off behind toward the very centre whither gravity was most inclined there where you have made your bed in it lie for wet or dry let what will for me betide you burning blowing freezing hailing famine waste you devil ride you tempest best you black and blue to rosora there i think in downright railing i can hold my own with you ah my good fife whose merry loyal pipe come weal come woe is never out of tune what you in the same plight too ah and madam sir hereby desire when you your own adventures sing another time in lofty rhyme you don't forget the trusty squire who went with you don quixote well my good fellow too leave pegasus who scarce can serve us than our horses worse they say no one should rob another of the single satisfaction he has left of singing his own sorrows one so great so says some great philosopher that trouble were worth encountering only for the sake of weeping over what perhaps you know some poet calls the luxury of woe had i the poet old philosopher in the place of her that kicked me off to ride i test his theory upon his hide but no bones broken madam sir i mean a scratch here that a handkerchief will heal and you 
a scratching quiddity or kind but not in quo my wounds are all behind but as you say to stop this strain which somehow once one's in the vein comes clattering after there again what are we twain just take it we two i mean to do drenched through and through oh i shall choke of rhymes which i believe are all that we shall have to live on here what is our victual gone too ah that brute has carried all we had away with her clothing and kate and all and now the sun our only friend and guide about to sink under the stage of earth and enter night with capi espado and pray heaven with butter lanthorn also ah i doubt to-night if any with a dark one or almost burnt out after a month's consumption well well or ill on horseback or afoot this is the gate that lets me into poland and sorry welcome as she gives a guest who writes his own arrival on her rocks in his own blood yet better on her stony threshold die than live on unrevenged in muscovy oh what a soul some women have i mean some men oh fife fife as you love me fife make yourself perfect in that little part or all will go to ruin oh i will please god we find some one to try it on but truly would not any one believe some fairy had exchanged us as we lay two tiny foster children in one cradle well be that as it may fife it reminds me of what perhaps i should have thought before but better late than never you know i love you as you i know love me and loyally have followed me thus far in my wild venture well now then having seen me safe thus far safe if not wholly sound over the rocks into the country where my business lies why should not you return the way we came the storm all cleared away and leaving me who now shall want you though not thank you less now that our horse is gone this side the ridge find your way back to dear old home again while i come come what weeping my poor fellow leave you here alone my lady lord i mean my lord in a strange country among savages oh no i know you would be rid of me for fear my stumbling speech oh no 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 i want you with me for a thousand sakes to which that is as nothing i myself more apt to let the secret out myself without your help at all come come cheer up and if you sing again come weal come woe let it be that for we will never part until you give the signal tis a bargain now to begin then follow follow me you fairy elves that be ay and go on something of following darkness like a dream for that we are after no after the sun trying to catch hold of his glittering skirts that hang upon the mountains as he goes ay he's himself past catching as you spoke he heard what you were saying and just so like some scared water bird as we say in my country dove below well we must follow him as best we may poland is no great country and as rich in man and means will but few acres spare to lie beneath her barrier mountains bare we cannot i believe be very far from mankind or their dwellings Seeing it so and well provided for man woman and beast no not for beast ah but my heart begins to yearn for her 
keep close and keep your feet from serving you as hers did as for beasts in default of other entertainment we should provide them with ourselves to eat bears lions wolves oh never fear or else default of other beast beastlier men cannibals anthropophagy bear poles who never knew a tailor but by taste look look unless my fancy misconceive with twilight down among the rocks there five some human dwelling surely or think you but a rock torn from the rocks in some convulsion like to-day's and perched quaintly among them in mock masonry most likely that i doubt no no for look a square of darkness opening in it oh i don't have like such openings like the loom of night from which she spins her outer gloom lord madam pray forbear this tragic vein in such a time and place and now again within that square of darkness look a light that feels its way with hesitating pulse as we do through the darkness that it drives to blacken into deeper night beyond in which could we follow that light's example as might some english badolf with his nose we might defy this sunset hark a chain and now a lamp a lamp and now the hand that carries it oh lord that dreadful chain and now the bearer of the lamp indeed as strange as any in arabian tale so giant-like and terrible and grand spite of the skin he's wrapped in why tis his own or oh, tis some wild man of the woods i've heard they build and carry torches never ape bore such a brow before the heavens as that chained as you say too oh that dreadful chin and now he sets the lamp down by his side and with one hand clenched in his tangled hair and with a sigh as if his heart would break during this sigismund has entered from the fortress with a torch once more the storm has roared itself away splitting the crags of god as it retires but sparing still what it should only blast this guilty piece of human handiwork and all that are within it oh how oft how oft within or here abroad have i waited and in the whisper of my heart prayed for the slanting hand of heaven to strike the blow myself i dare not out of fear of that hereafter worse they say than here plunged headlong in but till dismissal waited to wipe at last all sorrows from men's eyes and make this heavy dispensation clear thus have i borne till now and still endure crouching in sullen impotence day by day till some such outburst of the elements like this rouses the sleeping fire within and standing thus upon the threshold of another night about to close the door upon one wretched day to open it on one yet wretcheder because one more once more you savage heavens i ask of you i looking up to those relentless eyes that now the greater lamp is gone below begin to muster in the listening skies in all the shining circuits you have gone about this theatre of human woe what greater sorrow have you gazed upon than down this narrow chink you witness still and which did you yourselves not for devise you registered for others to fulfill this is some laureate at a birthday ode no wonder we went rhyming hush and now see starting to his feet he strides about far as his tethered steps and if the chain you helped to rivet round me did contract since guiltless infancy from guilt in act of what in aspiration or in thought guilty but in resentment of the wrong that wrecks revenge on wrong i never wrought 
by excommunication from the free inheritance that all created life besides myself is born too from the wings that range your own immeasurable blue down to the poor mute scale imprisoned things that yet are free to wander glide and pass about that under sapphire whereinto yourselves transfusing you yourselves in glass what mystery is this why the man's mad that's all the mystery that's why he's chained and why nor nature's guiltless life alone but that which lives on blood and rapine nay chartered with larger liberty to slay their guiltless kind the tyrants of the air soar zenith upward with their screaming prey making pure heaven drop blood upon the stage of under earth where lion wolf and bear and they that on their treacherous velvet wear figure and constellation like your own with their still living slaughter bound away over the barriers of the mountain cage against which one blood guiltless and endued with aspiration and with aptitude transcending other creatures day by day beats himself mad with unavailing rage why that must be the meaning of my mule's rebellion hush but then if murder be the law by which not only conscience blind creatures but man too prospers with his kind who leaving all his guilty fellows free under your fatal auspice and divine compulsion leagued in some mysterious ban against one innocent and helpless man abuse their liberty to murder mine and sworn to silence like their masters mute in heaven and like them twirling through the mask of darkness answering to all i ask point up to them whose work they execute even as i thought some poor unhappy wretch by man wronged wretched unrevenged as i nay so much worse than i as by those chains clipped of the means of self-revenge on those who lay on him what they deserve and i who taunted heaven a little while ago with pouring all its wrath upon my head alas like him who caught a cast-off husk of what another bragged of feeding on here's one that from the refuse of my sorrows could gather all the banquet he desires poor soul poor soul speak lower he will hear you and if he should what then why if he would he could not harm me nay and if he could methinks i'd venture something of a life i care so little for who's that clotaldo who are you i say that venturing in these forbidden rocks have lighted on my miserable life and your own death you would not hurt me surely not i but those that iron as the chain in which they slay me with a lingering death will slay you with a sudden who are you a stranger from across the mountain there who having lost his way in this strange land and coming night drew hither to what seemed a human dwelling hidden in these rocks and where the voice of human sorrow soon told him it was so i but nearer nearer that by this smoky supplement of day but for a moment i may see who speaks so pitifully sweet take care take care alas poor man that i myself so helpless could better help you than by barren pity and my poor presence oh might that be all but that a few poor moments and alas the very bliss of having and a dread of losing under such a penalty as ever moments having runs more near stifles the very utterance and resource they cry for quickest till from sheer despair of holding thee methinks myself would tear to pieces there his words enough for it oh think if you who move about at will and live in sweet communion with your kind after an hour lost in these lonely rocks hunger and thirst after some human voice to drink and human face to feed upon what must one do where all is mute or harsh and e'en the naked face of cruelty were better than the mask it works beneath across the mountain then across the mountain what if the next world which they tell one of be only next across the mountain then though i must never see it till i die and you one of its angels alas alas no angel 
and the face you think so fair tis but the dismal framework of these rocks that makes it seem so and the world i come from alas alas too many faces there are but fair visors to black hearts below or only serve to bring the wearer woe but to yourself if haply the redress that i am here upon may help to yours i heard you tax the heavens with ordering and men for executing what alas i now behold but why and who they are who do and you who suffer sigismund pointing upwards ask of them whom as to-night i have so often asked and asked in vain but surely surely hark the trumpet of the watch to shut us in oh should they find you quick behind the rocks to-morrow if to-morrow rosora flinging her sword toward him take my sword rosora and fife hide in the rocks enter clotaldo these stormy days you like to see the last of are but ill opiates sigismund i think for night to follow and to-night you seem more than your wont disordered what a sword within there enter soldiers with black visors and torches here is a pleasant masquerade whosoever watch this was will have to pay head reckoning meanwhile this weapon had a wearer bring him here dead or alive clotaldo good clotaldo clotaldo to soldiers who enclose sigismund others searching the rocks you know your duty soldiers bringing in rosora and fife here are two of them whoever more to follow who are you that in defiance of known proclamation are found at nightfall too about this place or oh, my lord she i mean he silence fife and let me speak for both two foreign men to whom your country and its proclamations are equally unknown and had we known ourselves not masters of our lawless beasts that terrified by the storm among your rocks flung us upon them to our cost my mule foreigners of what country muscovy and whither bound hither if this be poland but with no ill design on her and therefore taking it ill that we should thus be stopped upon her threshold so uncivilly whither in poland to the capital and on what errand set me on the road and you shall be nearer to my answer clotaldo aside so resolute and ready to reply and yet so young and aloud well your business was not surely with the man we found you with he was the first we saw and strangers and benighted as we were as you too would have done in a like case accosted him at once ay but this sword i flung it towards him well and why and why but to revenge himself on those who thus injuriously misuse him so 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 tis well such resolution wants a beard and i suppose is never to attain one well i must take you both you and your sword prisoners fife offering a cudgel pray take mine and welcome sir i'm sure i gave it to that mule of mine to mighty little purpose mine you have and may it win us some more kindliness than we have met with yet clotaldo examining the sword more mystery how came you by this weapon from my father and do you know whence he oh very well from one of this same polish realm of yours who promised a return should come the chance of courtesies that he received himself in muscovy and left this pledge of it not likely yet it seems to be redeemed clotaldo aside oh wondrous chance 
or wondrous providence the sword that i myself in moscovy when these white hairs were black for keepsake left of obligation for a like return to him who saved me wounded as i lay fighting against his country took me home tended me like a brother till recovered perchance to fight against him once again and now my sword put back into my hand by his if not his son still as so seeming by me as first to form of gratitude to seem believing till the wearer's self see fit to drop the ill dissembling mask aloud well a strange turn of fortune has arrested the sharp and sudden penalty that else had visited your rashness or mischance in part your tender youth too pardon me and touch not where your sword is not to answer commends you to my care not your life only else by this misadventure forfeited but even your errand which by happy chance chimes with the very business i am on and calls me to the very point you aim at the capital ay the capital and even that capital of capitals the court where you may plead and i may promise win pardon for this you say unwilling trespass and prosecute what else you have at heart with me to help you forward all i can provided all in loyalty to those to whom by natural allegiance i first am bound to as you make i take your offer with like promise on my side of loyalty to you and those you serve and the like reservation for regards nearer and dearer still enough enough your hand a bargain on both sides meanwhile here shall you rest to-night the break of day shall see us both together on the way thus then what i for misadventure blamed directly draws me where my wish is aimed Excellent. Scene two, the palace at Warsaw. Enter on one side Astolfo, Duke of Muscovy, with his train, and on the other the Princess Estrella with hers. My royal cousin, if so near in blood, till this auspicious meeting scarcely known, till all that beauty promised in the bud is now to its consummate blossom blown. Well met at last, and may... Enough, my lord of compliment devised for you by some court tailor and believe me still too short to cover the designful heart below nay but indeed fair cousin ay let deed measure your words indeed your flowers of speech ill with your iron equipage atone irony indeed and wordy compliment indeed indeed you wrong me royal cousin as fair as royal misinterpreting what even for the end you think i aim at if false to you were fatal to myself why what else means the glittering steel my lord that bristles in the rear of these fine words what can it mean but failing to cajole to fight or force me from my just pretension nay might i not ask even the same of you the nodding helmets of whose men-at-arms outcrest the plumage of your lady court but to defend what yours would force from me might not i lady say the same of mine but not to come to battle even of words with a fair lady and my kinswoman and as averse to stand before your face defenceless and condemned in your disgrace till the good king be here to clear it all will you vouchsafe to hear me as you will you know that when about to leave this world our royal grandsire king alfonso left three children one a son basilio who wears long may he wear the crown of poland and daughters twain of whom the elder was your mother clorelina now some while exalted to a more than mortal throne and resucinda mine the younger sister who married to the prince of muscovy gave me the light which she may live to see herself for many many years to come meanwhile good king basilio as you know deep in abstruser studies than this world and busier with the stars than ladies eyes 
has never by a second marriage yet replaced, as Poland asked of him, the heir an early marriage brought and took away, his young queen dying with the son she bore him, and in such alienation grown so old as leaves no other hope of heir to Poland than his two sisters' children, you, fair cousin, and me, for whom the commons of the realm divide themselves into two several factions, whether for you, the elder sister's child, or me, born of the younger, but, they say, my natural prerogative of man outweighing your priority of birth. Which discord, growing loud and dangerous, our uncle, King Basilio, doubly sage in prophesying and providing for the future, as to deal with it when it come, bids us here meet to-day in solemn council our several pretensions to compose. And but the martial outburst that proclaims his coming makes all further parley vain, unless my bosom, by which only wise I prophesy, now wrongly prophesies, by such a happy compact as I dare but glance at, till the royal sage declare. Trumpets, etc. Enter King Basilio with his council. The king! The king! God, God save the, the king! king. Estrella, kneeling. O oh, royal sir! Astolfo, kneeling. God save your majesty. Rise, both of you. Rise to my arms, Astolfo and Estrella. As my two sisters' children, always mine, now more than ever, since myself and Poland, solely to you, for what our succession looked. But now, give ear, you and your several factions, and you, the peers and princes of this realm, while I reveal the purport of this meeting in words whose necessary length I trust no unsuccessful issue shall excuse. You and the world, who have surnamed me Sage, know that I owe that title, if my due, to my long meditation on the book which ever lying open overhead the book of heaven, I mean, so few have read, whose golden letters on whose sapphire leaf, distinguishing the page of day and night, and all the revolution of the year, so with the turning volume where they lie, still changing their prophetic syllables, they register the destinies of men, until with eyes that, dim with years indeed, are quicker to pursue the stars than rule them. I get the start of time, and from his hand the wand of tardy revelation draw. Oh, had the selfsame heaven upon his page inscribed my death ere I should read my life, and, by forecasting of my own mischance, play not the victim, but the suicide in my own tragedy. But you shall hear. You know how once, as kings must for their people, and only once, as wise men for themselves, I wooed and wedded, know too that my queen, in childing, died, but not, as you believe, with her the son she died in giving life to, for, as the hour of birth was on the stroke, her brain, conceiving with her womb, she dreamed a serpent tore her entrail, and too surely, for evil omen seldom speaks in vain, the man-child breaking from that living tomb that makes our birth the antitype of death, man grateful for the life she gave him, paid by killing her, and with such circumstance as suited such unnatural tragedy. He, coming into light, if light it were, that darkened at his very horoscope, when heaven's two champions, sun and moon, I mean, suffused in blood upon each other fell in such a raging duel of eclipse, as hath not terrified the universe since that which wept in blood the death of Christ. When the dead walked, the waters turned to blood, earth and her cities tottered, and the world seemed shaken to its last paralysis. In such a paroxysm of dissolution that son of mine was born. By that first act, 
heading the monstrous catalogue of crime i found forewritten in his horoscope as great a monster in man's history as was in nature his nativity so savage bloody terrible and impious who should he live would tear his country's entrails as by his birth his mother's with which crime beginning he should clench the dreadful tail by trampling on his father's silver head all which for reading and his act of birth fates warrant that i read his life aright to save his country from his mother's fate i gave abroad that he had died with her his being slew with midnight secrecy i had him carried to a lonely tower hewn from the mountain barriers of the realm and under strict anathema of death guarded from men's inquisitive approach save from the trusty few one needs must trust who while his fastened body they provide with salutary garb and nourishment instruct his soul in what no soul may miss of holy faith and in such other lore as may solace his life imprisonment and tame perhaps the savage prophesied towards such a trial as i aim at now and now demand your special hearing too what in this fearful business i have done judge whether lightly or maliciously i with my own and only flesh and blood and proper lineal inheritor i swear at his foretold atrocities touched me alone i had not saved myself at such a cost to him but as a king a christian king i say advisedly who would devote his people to a tyrant worse than caligula for chronicled but even this not without grave misgiving lest by some chance misreading of the stars or misdirection of what rightly read i wrong my son of his prerogative and poland of her rightful sovereign for sure and certain prophets as the stars although they err not he who reads them may or rightly reading seeing there is one who governs them as under him they us we are not sure if the rough diagram they draw in heaven and we interpret here be sure of operation if the will supreme that sometimes for some special end the course of providential nature breaks by miracle may not of these same stars cancel his own first draught or overrule what else for written all else overrules as for example should the will almighty permit the free will of particular man to break the meshes of else strangling fate which free will fearful of foretold abuse i have myself from my own son foreclosed from ever possible self-extrication a terrible responsibility not to the conscience to be reconciled unless opposing almost certain evil against so slight contingency of good well thus perplexed i have resolved at last to bring the thing to trial whereunto here have i summoned you my peers and you whom i more dearly look to failing him as witnesses to that which i propose and thus propose the doing it clotaldo who guards my son with old fidelity shall bring him hither from his tower by night locked in a sleep so fast as by my art i rivet to within a link of death but yet from death so far that next day's dawn shall wake him up upon the royal bed complete in consciousness and faculty when with all princely pomp and retinue my loyal peers with due obeisance shall hail him sigismund the prince of poland then if with any show of human kindness he fling discredit not upon the stars but upon me their misinterpreter 
with all apology mistaken age can make to youth it never meant to harm to my son's forehead will i shift the crown i long have wished upon a younger brow and in religious humiliation for what of worn-out age remains to me entreat my pardon both of heaven and him for tempting destinies beyond my reach but if if i misdoubt at his first step the hoof of the predicted savage shows before predicted mischief can be done the self-same sleep that loosed him from the chain shall reconcile him not to loose again then shall i having lost that air direct look solely to my sister's children twain each of a claim so equal as divides the voice of poland to their several sides but as i trust to be entwined ere long into one single wreath so fair and strong as shall at once all difference atone and cease the realm's division with their own cousins and princes peers and counsellors such is the purport of this invitation and such is my design whose furtherance if not as sovereign if not as seer yet one whom these white locks if nothing else to patient acquiescence consecrate i now demand and even supplicate such news and from such lips may well suspend the tongue to loyal answer most attuned but if to me as spokesman of my faction your highness looks for answer i reply for one and all let segismund whom now we first hear tell of as your living heir appear and but in your sufficient eye approve himself worthy to be your son then we will hail him poland's rightful heir what says my cousin i with all my heart but if my youth and sex upbraid me not that i should dare ask of so wise a king ask ask fair cousin nothing i am sure not well considered nay if twere yet nothing but pardonable from such lips as those then with your pardon sir if segismund my cousin whom i shall rejoice to hail as prince of poland too as you propose be to a trial coming upon which more as i think than life itself depends why sir with sleep disordered senses brought to this uncertain contest with his stars well asked indeed and wisely be it answered because it is uncertain see you not for as i think i can discern between the sudden flaws of a sleep startled man and of the savage thing we have to dread if but bewildered dazzled and uncouth as might the sanest and the civilest in circumstance so strange nay more than that if moved to any outbreak short of blood all shall be well with him and how much more if mid the magic turmoil of the change he shall so calm a resolution show as scarce to reel beneath so great a blow but if with savage passion uncontrolled he lay about him like the brute foretold and must as suddenly be caged again then what redoubled anguish and despair from that brief flash of blissful liberty remitted and for ever to his chain which so much less if on the stage of glory entered and exited through such a door of sleep as makes a dream of all between oh kindly answer sir to question that to charitable courtesy less wise might call for pardon rather i shall now gladly what uninstructed loyally i should have waited your highness doubts not me nor how my heart follows my cousin's lips whatever way the doubtful balance fall still loyal to your bidding so, so say all. all i hoped and did expect of all no less and sure no sovereign ever needed more from all who owe him love or loyalty for what a strait of time i stand upon when to this issue not alone i bring my son your prince but e'en myself your king and whichsoever way for him it turn of less than little honour to myself 
for if this coming trial justify my thus withholding from my son his right is not the judge himself justified in the father's shame and if the judge proved wrong my son withholding from his right thus long shame and remorse to judge and father both unless remorse and shame together drowned in having what i flung for worthless found but come already weary with your travel and ill refreshed by this strange history until the hours that draw the sun from heaven unite us at the customary board each to his several chamber you to rest i to contrive with old clotaldo best the method of a stranger thing than old time has a yet among his records told excellent end of act one Act Two of Life is a Dream by Pedro Calderon de la Barca, translated by Edward Fitzgerald, 1809 to 1883. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two Scene One A Throne Room in the Palace, Music Within. Enter King and Clotaldo meeting a lord in waiting you for a moment beckon from your office tell me thus far how goes it in due time the potion left him at the very hour to which your highness tempered it yet not so wholly but some lingering mist still hung about his dawning senses which to clear we filled and handed him a morning drink with sleep's specific antidote suffused and while with princely raiment we invested what nature surely modelled for a prince all but the sword as you directed ay if not too loudly yet emphatically still with the title of a prince addressed him how bore he that with all the rest my liege i will not say so like one in a dream as one himself misdoubting that he dreamed so far so well clotaldo either way and best of all if toward the worse i dread but yet no violence at most impatience wearied perhaps with importunities we yet were bound to offer oh clotaldo though thus far well yet would myself have drunk the potion he revives from such suspense crowds all the pulses of life's residue into the present moment and i think whichever way the trembling scale may turn will leave the crown of poland for some one to wait no longer than the setting sun courage my liege the curtain is undrawn and each must play his part out manfully leaving the rest to heaven whose written words if i should misinterpret or transgress but as you say to the lord who exits you back to him at once clotaldo you when he is somewhat used to the new world of which they call him prince where place and face and all is strange to him with your known features and familiar garb shall then as chorus to the scene accost him and by such earnest of that old and too familiar world assure him of the new last in the strange procession i myself will by one full and last development complete the plot for that catastrophe that he must put to all god grant it be the crown of poland on his brows hark hark was that his voice within now louder o oh, clotaldo what so soon begun to roar again above the music but be tied what may until the moment we must hide exeunt king and clotaldo sigismund within forbear i stifle with your perfume cease your crazy salutations peace i say begone or let me go 
ere I go mad with all this babble, mummery, and glare, for I am growing dangerous. Air, room, air. He rushes in. Music ceases. Oh, but to save the reeling brain from wreck with its bewildered senses. He covers his eyes for a while. What? E'en now? That babble left behind me, but my eyes pursued by the same glamour, that, unless alike bewitched too, the confederate sense vouches for palpable, bright shining floors that ring hard answer back to the stamped heel, and shoot up airy columns marble cold, that, as they climb, break into golden leaf and capital, till they embrace aloft in clustering flower and fruitage over walls hung with such purple curtain as the west fringes with such a gold, or overlaid with sanguine glowing semblances of men, each in his all but living action busied, or from the wall they look from with fixed eyes pursuing me, and one most strange of all that, as I passed the crystal on the wall, looked from it, left it, and as I return, returns and looks me face to face again, unless some false reflection of my brain the outward semblance of myself, myself? How know that tawdry shadow for myself, but that it moves as I move, lifts his hand with mine, each motion echoing so close the immediate suggestion of the will in which myself I recognize, myself. What this fantastic Sigismund, the same who last night, as for all his nights before, lay down to sleep in wolfskin on the ground, in a black turret which the wolf howled round, and woke again upon a golden bed, round which, as clouds about a rising sun, in scarce less glittering comparison, gathered gay shapes that, underneath a breeze of music, handed him upon their knees the wine of heaven in a cup of gold, and still in soft melodious undersong, hailing me Prince of Poland, Sigismund, they said, our prince, the Prince of Poland, and again, oh, welcome, welcome to his own, our own Prince Sigismund, Oh, but a blast, one blast of the rough mountain air, one look at the grim features. He goes to the window. What, they despise it also? Shattered chaos cast into stately shape and masonry, between whose channeled and perspective sides, compact with rooted towers, and flourishing to heaven with gilded pinnacle and spire, flows the live current ever to and fro, with open aspect and free step. Clotaldo! Clotaldo, calling as one scarce dares call, for him who suddenly might break the spell, one fears to walk without him. Why, that I, with unencumbered step as any there, go stumbling through my glory, feeling for that iron leading string. I, for myself, for that fast anchored self of yesterday, of yesterday and all my life before, ere drifted clean from self-identity upon the fluctuation of today's mad whirling circumstance. And, fool, why not? If reason, sense, and self-identity, obliterated from a worn-out brain, art thou not maddest striving to be sane? And catching at that self of yesterday that, like a leper's rags, best flung away? Or, if not mad, then dreaming. Dreaming? Well, dreaming then. Or if self to self be true, not mocked by that, but as poor souls have been by those who wrong them, to give wrong new relish? Or have those stars indeed they told me of, as masters of my wretched life of old, into some happier constellation rolled, and brought my better fortune out on earth, clear as themselves in heaven? Prince Sigismund, they called me, and at will I shook them off. Will they return again at my command, again to call me so? Within there, you, Sigismund calls, Prince Sigismund. He has seated himself on the throne. Enter Chamberlain with Lords in Waiting. I rejoice that unadvised of any but the voice of royal instinct in the blood, your highness has ta'en the chair that you were born to fill. The chair? The royal throne of Poland, sir, which may your royal highness keep as long as he that now rules from it shall have ruled when heaven has called him to itself. When he? Your royal father, King Basilo, sir. My royal father, King Basilio. You see, I answer but as Echo does, not knowing what she listens or repeats. This is my throne. This is my palace. Oh, but this out of the window? Warsaw, sir. Your capital. And all the moving people. 
your subjects and your vassals, like ourselves. I, I, my subjects, in my capital, Warsaw, and I am prince of it. You see, it needs much iteration to strike sense into the human echo. Left a while, in the quick brain, the word will quickly to full meaning blow. You think so? And meanwhile, lest our obsequiousness, which means no worse than customary honour to the prince, we must rejoice to welcome, trouble you. Should we retire again, or stand apart, or would your highness have the music play, again with meditation, as they say, so often loves to float upon? The music? No, yes, perhaps the trumpet. Aside. Yet if that brought back the troop. The trumpet. There again, how trumpet-like spoke out the blood of Poland. Before the morning is far up, your highness, we'll have the trumpet marshalling your soldiers under the palace windows. Ah, my soldiers. My soldiers. Not black visored? Sir? Uh, no matter. But one thing, for a moment, in your ear. Do you know one Claude Haldol? Oh, my lord, he and myself together, I may say, although in different vocations, have silvered in your royal father's service, and as I trust, with both of us, a few white hairs to fall in yours. Well said, well said. Basilio, my father. Well, Clotalo, is he my kinsman too? Oh, my good lord, a general simply in your highness's service, than whom your highness has no trustier. Aye, so you said before, I think. And you with that white wand of yours. Why, now I think on it, I have read of such a silvered-haired magician with a wand, who in a moment with a wave of it, turned rags to jewels, clowns to emperors, by some benigner magic than the stars, spirited poor good people out of hand from all their woes, in some enchanted sleep, carried them off, on cloud or dragon back, over the mountains, over the wide deep, and set them down to wake in fairyland. Oh, my good lord, you laughed at me, and I, right glad to make you laugh at such a price, you know me no enchanter. If I were, and I with my wand as much as your highnesses, as now your chamberlain. My chamberlain? And these that follow you? And you, my lord, your highnesses lords in waiting? Lords in waiting? Well, I have now learned to repeat, I think, if only but by rote. This is my palace, and this is my throne, which unadvised, and that out of the window there, my capital, and all the people moving up and down, my subjects and my vassals, like yourselves, my chamberlain, and lords in waiting, and Clotaldo, and Clotaldo? You are an aged and seem a reverend man. You do not, though his fellow officer, you do not mean to mock me? Oh, my lord. Well then, if no magician, as you say, yet setting me a riddle that my brain, with all its senses whirling, cannot solve, Yourself, or one of these with you, must answer. How I, that only last night fell asleep, not knowing that the very soil of earth I lay down, chained to sleep upon, was Poland, awake to find myself the lord of it, with lords and generals and chamberlains, and e'en my very jailer for my vassals. Enter Clotaldo, suddenly. Stand all aside, that I may put into his hand the clue to lead him out of this amazement. Sir, vouchsafe your highness from my bended knee, receive my homage first. Clotaldo, what? At last, his old self, undisguised, were all his masquerade? To end it, you kneeling too? What? Have the stars you told me long ago laid that old work upon you, added this? that, having chained your prisoner so long, you loose his body, now to slay his wits? Dragging him, how I know not, whither scarce I understand, dressing him up in all this frippery, with your dumb familiars disvisored, and their lips unlocked to lie, calling him prince and king, and, madman-like, sending a crown of straw upon his head? Would but your highness, as indeed I now must call you, and upon his bended knee never bent subject more devotedly however all about you and perhaps you yourself incomprehensiblest but rest in the assurance of your own sane waking senses by these witnesses attested till the story of it all of which i bring a chapter be revealed assured of all you see and hear as neither madness nor mockery 
what then all it seems this palace with its royal garniture this capital of which it is the eye with all its temples marts and arsenals this realm of which this city is the head with all its cities villages and tilth its armies fleets and commerce all your own and all these living souls that make them up from those who now and those who shall salute you down to the poorest peasant of the realm your subjects who though now their mighty voice sleeps in the general body unapprised waits but a word from those above you now to hail you prince of poland sigismund all this is so as sure as anything is or can be you swear it on the faith you taught me elsewhere clotaldo kissing the hilt of his sword swear it upon this symbol and champion of the holy faith i wear it to defend sigismund to himself my eyes have not deceived me nor my ears with this transfiguration nor the strain of royal welcome that arose in blue breathed from no lying lips along with it for here clotaldo comes his own old self who if not lie and phantom with the rest aloud well then all this is thus for have not these fine people told me so and you clotaldo swore it and the why and wherefore are to follow by and by and yet and yet why wait for that which you who take your oath on it can answer and indeed it presses hard upon my brain what i was asking of these gentlemen when you came in upon us how it is that i the zigismund you know so long no longer than the sun that rose to-day rose and from what you know rose to be prince of poland so to be acknowledged and entreated sir so be acknowledged and entreated well but if now by all by some at least so known if not entreated heretofore though not by you for now i think again of what should be your attestation worth you that of all my questionable subjects who knowing what yet left me where i was you least of all clotaldo till the dawn of this first day that told it to myself oh let your highness draw the line across forewritten sorrow and in this new dawn bury that long sad night not e'en the dead called to the resurrection of the blessed shall so directly drop all memory of woes and wrongs foregone but not resent purged by the trial of that sorrow past for full fruition of their present bliss but leaving with the judge what till this earth be cancelled in the burning heavens he leaves his earthly delicates to execute of retribution in reward to them and woe to those who wrong them not as you not you clotaldo knowing not and yet e'en the guiltiest wretch in all the realm of any treason guilty short of that stern usage but assuredly not knowing not knowing twas your sovereign lord clotaldo you used so sternly ay sir with the same devotion and fidelity that now does homage to him for my sovereign fidelity that held his prince in chains fidelity more fast than had it loosed him e'en from the very dawn of consciousness down at the bottom of the barren rocks where scarce a ray of sunshine found him out in which the poorest beggar of my realm at least to human full proportion grows me me whose station was the kingdom's top to flourish in reaching my head to heaven and with my branches overshadowing the meaner growth below still with the same fidelity to me ay sir to you through that divine allegiance upon which all order and authority is based which to revolt against were to revolt against the stars belike and him who reads them and by that right and by the sovereignty he wears that you shall wear it after him ay one to whom yourself yourself even more than any subject here are bound by yet another and more strong allegiance king basilio your father basilio king my father o oh, my lord 
let me beseech you on my bended knee for your own sake for poland's and for his who looking up for counsel to the skies did what he did under authority to which the kings of earth themselves are subject and whose behest not only he that suffers but he that executes not comprehends but only he that orders it the king my father either i am mad already or that way driving fast or i should know that fathers do not use their children so or men were loosed from all allegiance to fathers kings in a heaven that ordered all but mad or not my hour is come and i will have my reckoning either you lie under the skirt of sinless majesty shrouding your treason or if that indeed guilty itself take refuge in the stars that cannot hear the charge or disavow you whether doer or deviser who come first to hand shall pay the penalty by the same hand you owe it to seizing clotaldo's sword and about to strike him enter rosora suddenly fie my lord forbear what a young hand raised against silver hair she retreats through the crowd stay stay what come and vanished as before i scarce remember how but voices within Room for Astolfo, Duke, Duke of Muscovy. Muscovy. Enter Astolfo. Welcome, thrice welcome, the auspicious day, when from the mountain where he darkling lay, the Polish sun into the firmament sprung all the brighter for his late ascent, and in meridian glory. Where is he? Why must I ask this twice? The page, my lord? I wonder at his boldness. But I tell you, he came with angel written in his face, as now it is, when all was black as hell about, and none of you who now. He came, and angel-like flung me a shining sword to cut my way through darkness, and again angel-like wrests it from me in behalf of one whom I will spare for sparing him. But he must come and plead with that same voice that prayed for me in vain. He is gone for, and shall attend your pleasure, sir. Meanwhile... Will not your highness, as in courtesy, return your royal cousin's greeting? Whose? Astofflo, Duke of Muscovy, my lord, saluted and with gallant compliments welcomed you to your royal title. Sigismund to Astolfo. Oh, you knew of this then? Knew of what, my lord? That I was Prince of Poland all the while, and you my subject? Pardon me, my lord, but some few hours ago myself I learned your dignity, but knowing it, no more than when I knew it not, your subject. What then? Your Highness Chamberlain even now has told you. Astolfo, Duke of Muscovy, your father's sister's son, your cousin, sir, and who, as such, and in his own right prince, expects from you the courtesy he shows. His Highness is as yet unused to court, and to the ceremonious interchange of compliments, especially to those who draw their blood from the same royal fountain. Where is the lad? I weary of all of this. Prince, cousins, chamberlains, and compliments. Where are my soldiers? Blow the trumpet, and with one sharp blast scatter these butterflies, and bring the man of iron to my side, with whom a king feels like a king indeed. Voices within. Within, within there. there. Room for Princess Estrella. Enter Estrella with ladies. Welcome, my lord, right welcome to the throne that much too long has waited for your coming. And in the general voice of Poland, here a kinswoman and cousins no less sincere. Ay, this is welcome worth indeed, and cousin, cousin worth. Oh, I have thus over the threshold of the mountains seen, leading a bevy of fair stars, the moon entered the court of heaven, my kinswoman, my cousin, but my subject? If you please, to count your cousin for your subject, sir, you shall not find her a disloyal. Oh, but there are twin stars in that heavenly face, that now I know for having overruled those evil ones that darkened all my past, and brought me forth from that captivity to be the slave of her who set me free. Indeed, my lord, these eyes have no such power over the past or present, but perhaps they brighten at your welcome to supply the little that a lady's speech commends and in the hope that, let whichever be the other subject, we may both be friends. Your hand to that. But why does this warm hand shoot a cold shudder through me? <laughs> in revenge for likening me to that 
cold moon, perhaps. Oh, but the lip whose music tells me so breathes of a warmer planet, and that lip shall remedy the treason of the hand. He catches to embrace her. <gasps> Release me, sir. And pardon me, my lord, this lady is a princess absolute, as prince he is who just saluted you and claims her by affiance. Hence, old fool, forever thrusting that white stick of yours between me and my pleasure. This cause is mine. Forbear, sir. What, sir mouthpiece, you again? My lord, I waive your insult to myself in recognition of the dignity you yet are new to, and that greater still you look in time to wear. But for this lady, whom if my cousin now, I hope to claim henceforth by yet a nearer, dearer name. And what care I? She is my cousin too. And if you be a prince, well, am not I lord of the very soil you stand upon? By that, and by that right beside a blood, that like a fiery fountain hitherto pent in the rock, leaps toward her at her touch, mine, before all the cousins in Muscovy. You call me Prince of Poland, and yourselves my subjects. Traitors, therefore, to this hour, who let me perish all my youth away, chained there among the mountains, till, forsooth, terrified at your treachery foregone, you spirit me up here, I know not how, popinjay like it, invest me like yourselves, choke me with scent and music that I loathe, and, worse than all the music and the scent, with false, long-winded, fulsome compliment, that, oh, you are my subjects, and, in word reiterating still obedience, thwart me indeed in every step I take, when just about to wreck a just revenge upon that old arch-traitor of you all, filch from my vengeance him I hate, and him I loved, the first and only face, till this, I cared to look on in your ugly court. And now, when probably I grasp at last what hitherto but shadowed in my dreams, affiances and interferences, the first who dares to meddle with me more, princes and chamberlains and counsellors, touch her who dares. That dare I. Sigismund, seizing him by the throat. You dare? My lord. His strength's a lion. Voices within. The, the king. king. The, the king. king. Enter king. And on a sudden, how he stands at gaze, as might a wolf just fastened on his prey, glaring at a suddenly encountered lion. And I that hither flew with open arms to fold them round my son, must now return to press them to an empty heart again. He sits on the throne. That is the king, my father? After a long pause. I've heard that sometimes some blind instinct has been known to draw to mutual recognition those of the same blood, beyond all memory divided, or even never met before. I know not how this is, perhaps in brutes that live by kindlier instincts, but I know that looking now upon that head whose crown pronounces him a sovereign king, I feel no setting of the current in my blood toward him as sire. How is it with you, old man? Toward him they call your son. Alas, alas! Your sorrow, then? Beholding what I do. Ay, but how know this sorrow that has grown and moulded to this present shape of man, as of your own creation? Even from birth. But from that hour to this, near as I think, some twenty such renewals of the year as trace themselves upon the barren rocks, I never saw you, nor you me, unless, unless indeed, through one of those dark masks through which a son might fail to recognize the best of fathers. Be that as you will, but now we see each other face to face. Know me as you I know, which did I not, by whatsoever signs assuredly, you were not here to prove it at my risk. You are my father, and is it true then, as Clotaldo swears, t'was you that from the dawning birth of one yourself brought into being, you, I say, who stole his very birthright, not alone that secondary and peculiar right of sovereignty, but even that prime inheritance that all men share alike. And chained him, chained him, like a wild beast's whelp, among as savage mountains, to this hour? Answer if this be thus. O oh, Sigismund, and all that I have done that seems to you, and, without further hearing, fairly seems unnatural and cruel. T'was not I, but one who writes his order in the sky, I dared not misinterpret nor neglect. Who knows with what reluctance? 
Oh, those stars, those stars that too far out from human blame to clear themselves, or careless of the charge, still bear upon their shining shoulders all the guilt men shift upon them. Nay, but think, not only on the common score of kind, but that peculiar count of sovereignty, if not behind the beast in brain as heart, how should I thus deal with my innocent child, doubly desired, and doubly dear when come as that sweet second self that all desire, and princes more than all, to root themselves by that succession in their people's hearts, unless at that superior will to which not kings alone, but sovereign nature bows. And what had those same stars to tell of me that should compel a father and a king so much against that double instinct? That which I have brought you hither at my peril, against their written warning to disprove, by justice, mercy, human kindliness. And therefore made yourself their instrument to make your son the savage and the brute they only prophesied? Are you not afeard, lest, irrespective as such creatures are of such relationship, the brute you made revenge the man you marred, like sire, like son, to do by you as you by me have done? You never had a savage heart from me. I may appeal to Poland. Then from whom? If pure and fountain, poisoned by yourself when scarce begun to flow, to make a man not, as I see, degraded from the mould I came from, nor compared to those about, and then to throw your own flesh to the dogs. Why not at once, I say, if terrified at the prophetic omens of my birth, have drowned or stifled me, as they do whelps too costly or too dangerous to keep? That, living, you might learn to live, and rule yourself and Poland. By the means you took to spoil for either? Nay, but, Sigismund, you know not, cannot know, happily wanting the sad experience on which knowledge grows, how the too early consciousness of power spoils the best blood, nor whether for your long constrained disinheritance, which, but for me, remember, and for my relenting love bursting the bond of fate, had been eternal, you have not now a full indemnity, wearing the blossom of your youth unspent in the voluptuous sunshine of a court that often, by too early blossoming, too soon deflowers the rose of royalty. I, for what some precocious warmth may spill, may not an early frost as surely kill? But, Sigismund, my son, whose quick discourse proves I have not extinguished and destroyed the man you charge me with extinguishing, however it condemned me for the fault of keeping a good light so long eclipsed. Reflect, this is the moment upon which those stars, whose eyes, although we see them not, by day as well as night, are on us still, hang watching up in the meridian heaven which way the balance turns. And if, to you, as by your dealing, God decide it may, to my confusion, let me answer it, unto yourself alone, who shall at once approve yourself to be your father's judge, and sovereign of Poland in his stead, by justice, mercy, self-sobriety, and all the reasonable attributes without which, impotent to rule himself, others one cannot, and one must not rule, but which, if you but show the blossom of, all that is past, we shall but look upon as the first outfling of a generous nature rioting in first liberty. And if this blossom do but promise such a flower as promises in turn its kindly fruit, forthwith upon your brows the royal crown that now weighs heavy on my aged brows, I will devolve. And while I pass away into some cloister with my maker there, to make my peace in penitence and prayer, happily settle the disordered realm that now cries loudly for a lineal heir. And so, when the crown falters on your shaking head, and slips the sceptre from your palsied hand, and Poland for her rightful heir cries out, 
when not only your stolen monopoly fails you of earthly power but cross the grave the judgment trumpet of another world calls you to count for your abuse of this then oh then terrified by the double danger you drag me from my den boast not of giving up at last the power you can no longer hold and never rightly held but in fee for him you robbed it from and be assured your savage once let loose will not be caged again so quickly not by threat or adulation to be tamed till he hath had his quarrel out with those who made him what he is beware beware subdue the kindled tiger in your eye nor dream that it was sheer necessity made me thus far relax the bond of fate and with far more of terror than of hope threaten myself my people and the state know that if old i yet have vigour left to wield the sword as well as wear the crown and if my more immediate issue fail not wanting signs of collateral blood whose wholesome growth shall more than compensate for all the loss of a distorted stem that will i straightway bring to trial oh after a revelation such as this the last day shall have little left to show of righted wrong and villainy requited nay judgment now beginning upon earth myself methinks in sight of all my wrongs appointed heaven's avenging minister accuser judge and executioner sword in hand sight the guilty first as worst the usurper of his son's inheritance him and his old accomplice time and crime inveterate and unable to repay the golden years of life they stole away what does he yet maintain his state and keep the throne he should be judged from down with him that i may trample on the false white head so long has worn my crown where are my soldiers of all my subjects and my vassals here not one to do my bidding hark a trumpet the trumpet he pauses as the trumpet sounds as in act one and masked soldiers gradually fill in behind the throne king rising before his throne ay indeed the trumpet blows a memorable note to summon those who if forthwith you fall not at the feet of him whose head you threaten with the dust forthwith shall draw the curtain of the past about you and this momentary gleam of glory that you think to hold life fast so coming so shall vanish as a dream he prophesies the old man prophesies and at his trumpet summons from the tower the leash-bound shadows loosened after me my rising glory reach and overlower but reach not i my height he shall not hold but with me back to his own darkness he dashes toward the throne and is enclosed by soldiers traitors hold off unhand me am not i your king and you would strangle him but i am breaking with an inward fire shall scorch you off and wrap me on the wings of conflagration from a kindled pyre of lying prophecies and prophet kings above the extinguished stars reach me the sword he flung me fill me such a bowl of wine as that you walk the day with and shall close but of the vintage that clotaldo knows excellent end of act two Act Three of Life is a Dream by Pedro Calderon de la Barca, translated by Edward Fitzgerald, 1809 to 1883. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One, The Tower, etc., as in Act One, Scene One. Sigismund as at first, and Clotaldo. Princes and princesses, and counsellors flustered to right and left, my life made at? But that was nothing. Even the white-haired venerable king seized on. Indeed, you made wild work of it, and so discovered in your outward action, flinging your arms about you in your sleep, grinding your teeth, and as i now remember woke mouthing out judgment and execution on those about you ay i did indeed e now your eyes stare wild your hair stands up your pulses throb and flutter reeling still under the storm of such a dream 
A dream that seemed as swearable reality as what I wake in now. Aye, wonderful how imagination in a sleeping brain out of the uncontingent senses draws sensations strong as from the real touch. That we not only laugh aloud and drench with tears our pillow, but in the agony of some imaginary conflict fight and struggle even as you did some tis thought under the dreamt-of stroke of death have died and what's so very strange too in that world where place as well as people all was strange even i almost as strange unto myself you only you clotaldo you as much and palpably yourself as now you are came in this very garb you ever wore by such a token of the past you said to assure me of that seeming present i i and even told me of the very stars you tell me here of how in spite of them i was enlarged to all that glory i by the false spirit's nice contrivance thus a little truth oft leavens all the false the better to delude us for you know tis nothing but a dream nay you yourself know best how lately you awoke from that you know you went to sleep on why have you never dreamt the like before never to such reality such dreams are oftentimes the sleeping exhalations of that ambition that lies smouldering under the ashes of the lowest fortune by which when reason slumbers or has lost the reins of sensible comparison we fly at something higher than we are scarce ever dive to lower to be kings or conquerors crowned with laurels or with gold nay mounting heaven itself on eagle wings which by the way now that i think on it may furnish us the key to this high flight that royal eagle we were watching and talking of as you went to sleep last night last night last night ay do you not remember envying his immunity of flight as rising from his throne of rock he sailed above the mountains far into the west that burned about him while with poising wings he darkled in it as a burning brand is seen to smoulder in the fire it feeds last night last night oh what a day was that between that last night and this sad to-day and yet perhaps only some few dark moments into which imagination once lit up within and unconditional of time and space can pour infinities and i remember how the old man they called the king who wore a crown of gold about his silver hair and a mysterious girdle round his waist just when my rage was roaring at its height and after which it all was dark again bid me beware lest all should be a dream ay there another speciality of dreams that once the dreamer gins to dream he dreams his foot is on the very verge of waking would it have been upon the verge of death that knows no waking lifting me up to glory to fall back stunned crippled wretcheder than even before yet not so glorious sigismund if you your visionary honour wore so ill as to work murder and revenge on those who meant you well who meant me me their prince chained like a felon stay stay not so fast you dreamed the prince remember then in dream revenged it only true but as they say dreams are rough copies of the waking soul yet uncorrected of the higher will so that men sometimes in their dreams confess an unsuspected or forgotten self one must beware to check ay if one may stifle ere born such passion in ourselves as makes we see such havoc with our sleep and ill reacts upon the waking day 
and by the by for one test sigismund between such swearable realities since dreaming madness passion are akin in missing each that salutary reign of reason and the guiding will of man one test i think of waking sanity shall be that conscious power of self-control to curb all passion but much most of all that evil and vindictive that ill squares with human and with holy canon less which bids us pardon even our enemies and much more those who out of no ill will mistakenly have taken up the rod which heaven they think has put into their hands i think i soon shall have to try again sleep has not yet done with me such a sleep take my advice tis early yet the sun's scarce up above the mountain go within and if the night deceived you try anew with morning morning dreams they say come true oh rather pray for me a sleep so fast as shall obliterate dream and waking too exit into the tower so sleep sleep fast and sleep away those two night potions and the waking dream between which dream thou must believe and if to see again poor sigismund that dream must be and yet and yet in these our ghostly lives half night half day half sleeping half awake how if our waking life like that of sleep be all a dream in that eternal life to which we wake not till we sleep in death how if i say the senses we now trust for date of sensible comparison i even the reason's self that dates with them should be in essence or intensity hereafter so transcended and awake to a perceptive subtlety so keen as to confess themselves befooled before in all that now they will avouch for most one man like this but only so much longer as life is longer than a summer's day believed himself a king upon his throne and played at hazard with his fellows lives who cheaply dreamed away their lives to him the sailor dreamed of tossing on the flood the soldier of his laurels grown in blood the lover of the beauty that he knew must yet dissolve to dusty residue the merchant and the miser of his bags of fingered gold the beggar of his rags and all this stage of earth on which we seem such busy actors and the parts we played substantial as the shadow of a shade and dreaming but a dream within a dream was it not said sir by some philosopher as yet unborn that any chimney sweep who for twelve hours dreams himself king is as happy as the king who dreams himself twelve hours a chimney sweep a theme indeed for wiser heads than yours to moralize upon how came you here not of my own will i assure you sir no matter for myself but i would know about my mistress i mean master oh now i remember well your master mistress is well and deftly on its errand speeds as you shall if you can but hold your tongue can you i'd rather be at home again where you shall be the quicker if while here you can keep silence i may whistle then which by virtue of my name i do but also as a reasonable test of waking sanity well whistle then and for another reason you forgot that while you whistle you can chatter not only remember if you quit this pass 
his rhymes are out, or he had called it spot. A bullet brings you to. I must forthwith to court to tell the king the issue of this lamentable day that buries all his hope in night. To Fife. Farewell. Remember. But a moment, but a word. When shall I see my miss must? Be content, all in good time, and then, and not before, never to miss your master any more. Exit. Such talk of dreaming, dreaming, I begin, to doubt if I be dreaming I am fife, who with a lad who called herself a boy, because I doubt there's some confusion here he wore no petticoat came on a time riding from moscovy on half a horse who must have dreamt she was a horse entire to cant me off upon my hinder face under this tower wall-eyed and musket-tongued with sentinels a-pacing up and down crying all's well when all is far from well all the day long and all the night until i dream if what is dreaming be not waking of bells a tolling and processions rolling with candles crosses banners sen benitos of which i wear the flammy finning jest through streets and places thronged with fiery faces to some back platform oh i shall take a fire into my hand with thinking of my own dear moscovy only just over that sierra there by which we tumbled headlong into no land now if without a bullet after me i could but get a peep of my old home perhaps of my own mule to take me there all still perhaps the gentlemen within are dreaming it is night behind their masks god send em a good nightmare now then hark voices and up the rocks and armed men climbing like cats puss in the corner then he hides enter soldiers cautiously up the rocks this is the frontier pass at any rate where pullen ends and muscovy begins we must be close upon the tower i know that halfway up the mountain lies ensconced how know you that he told me so the page who put us on the scent and as i think we'll soon be here to run it down with us meantime our horses on these ugly rocks useless and worse than useless with their clatter leave them behind with one or two in charge and softly 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 there it is there what the tower the fortress that the tower that mouse-trap we could pitch it down the rocks with our hands the rocks it hangs among dwarf its proportions and conceal its strength larger and stronger than you think no matter no place for poland's prince to be shut up in at it at once no no i tell you wait till those within give signal for as yet we know not who side with us and the fort is strong in man and musket shame to wait for odds with such a cause at stake because of such a cause at stake we wait for odds for if not won at once forever lost for any long resistance on their part would bring basilio's force to succor them ere we have rescued him we come to rescue so softly 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 still soldiers discovering fife hello hello here's someone skulking seize and gag him 
stab him at once say i the only way to make all sure hold every man of you and down upon your knees why this is the prince the, the prince? prince oh i should know him anywhere and anyhow disguised but the prince is chained and of a loftier presence tis he i tell you only bewildered as he was before god, god save, save your, your royal, royal highness, highness. On, on our, our knees, knees beseech you, beseech you answer, answer us, us just as you please well tis this country's custom i suppose to take a poor man every now and then and set him on the throne just for the fun of tumbling him again into the dirt and now my turn is come tis very pretty his wits have been distempered with their drugs but do you ask him captain on my knees and in the name of all who kneel with me, I do beseech your highness answer to your royal title. Still, just as you please, in my own poor opinion of myself, but that may all be dreaming, which it seems is very much the fashion in this country. No Polish prince at all, but a poor lad from Moscovy will only help me back. I promise never to contest the crown of Poland with whatever gentleman you fancy to set up. From Moscovy? A spy, then. Are the Stoffels? Spy, spy, a spy. A spy. Hang him at Hang once. Hang him at once. No, pray don't dream of that. How dared you then set yourself up for our Prince Segismund? I set up? I like that. When twas yourselves, be Sigismunded me. No matter. Look. The signal from the tower. Prince Segismund. Soldiers from the tower. Prince Segismund. All's well. Clotaldo safe secured. Soldiers from the tower. No, by ill luck, instead of coming in as we had looked for, he sprang on horse at once and off at gallop. To court, no doubt, a blunder that, and yet perchance a blunder that may work as well as better forethought, having no suspicion, so will he carry none where his not going were of itself suspicious, but of those within who side with us oh one and all to the last man persuaded or compelled enough whatever be to be retrieved no moment to be lost for though clotaldo have no revolt to tell of in the tower the capital will soon awake to ours and the king's forces come blazing after us where is the prince within so fast asleep we woke him not even striking off the chain we had so cursedly help bind him with not knowing what we did but too ashamed not to undo ourselves what we had done no matter nor by whosoever hands provided done come we will bring him forth out of that stony darkness here abroad where air and sunshine sooner shall disperse the sleepy fume which they have drugged him with they enter the tower and thence bring out sigismund asleep on a pallet and set him in the middle of the stage still still so dead asleep the very noise and motion that we make in carrying him stirs not a leaf in all the living tree if living but if by some inward blow for ever and irrevocably felled by what strikes deeper to the root than sleep he's dead he's dead, he's dead. He's they dead. killed him no he breathes and the heart beats and now he breathes again, deeply, as one about to shake away the load of sleep. Come, let us all kneel round, and with a blast of warlike instruments, and acclamation of all loyal hearts, rose and restore him to his royal right, from which no royal wrong shall drive him more. They all kneel round his bed, trumpets, drums, etc. Sigismund! 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 Sigismund. Prince Sigismund! Sigismund. King Segismund, king Segismund, down with Basilio, down with, Basilio. Down with us, Tolfo. Segismund, Segismund our king. king. He stares upon us wildly, 
he cannot speak i said so driven him mad speak to him captain o oh, royal segimond our prince and king look on us listen to us answer us your faithful soldiery and subjects now about you kneeling but on fire to rise and cleave a passage through your enemies until we seat you on your lawful throne for through your father king basilio now king of poland jealous of the stars that prophecy his setting with your rise here holds you ignominiously eclipsed and what is stolfo duke of muscovy mount to the throne of poland after him so will not we your loyal soldiery and subjects neither those of us now first apprised of your existence and your right nor those that hitherto deluded by allegiance false their visors now fling down and craving pardon on their knees with us for that unconscious disloyalty offer with us the service of their blood not only we and they but at our heels the heart if not the bulk of poland falls to join their voices and their arms with ours in vindicating with our lives our own prince segimond to poland dinner throne sigismund sigismund prince sigismund our own king sigismund they all rise again so soon what not yet done with me the sun is a little higher up i think than when i last lay down to bury in the death of your own sea you that infest its shallows sir and now not in a palace not in the fine clothes we all were in but here in the old place and in our old accoutrement only your visors off and lips unlocked to mock me with that idle title nay indeed no idle title but your own then now and now forever for behold even as i speak the mountain passes fill and bristle with the advancing soldiery that glitters in your rising glory sir and at our signal echo to our cry segimond king of poland shouts trumpets etc oh how cheap the muster of a countless host of shadows as impotent to do with as to keep all this they said before to softer music soft music sir to what indeed were shadows that following the sunshine of a court shall back be brought with it if shadows still yet to substantial reckoning they shall the white-haired and white-wanded chamberlain so busy with his wand too the old king that i was somewhat hard on he had been hard upon me and a fine-feathered prince who crowed so loud my cousin and another another cousin we will not bear hard on and but clothaldo fled my lord but close pursued and then then as he fled before and after he had sworn it on his knees came back to take me where i am no more no more of this away with you be gone whether but visions of ambitious night that morning ought to scatter or grown out of night's proportions you invade the day to scare me from my little wits yet left be gone i know i must be near awake knowing i dream or if not in my voice then vanish at the clapping of my hands or take this foolish fellow for your sport dressing me up in visionary glories which the first air of waking consciousness scatters as fast as from the almander that waking one fine morning in full flower one rougher insurrection of the breeze of all her sudden honour disadorns to the last blossom and she stands again the winter naked scarecrow that she was i know not what to do nor what to say with all this dreaming i begin to doubt they have driven him mad indeed and he and we are lost together soldiers to captain stay stay i remember hearken your ear a moment whispers so 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 oh now indeed i do not wonder sir your senses dozzle under practices which treason shrinking from its own device would now persuade you only was a dream but waking was as absolute as this you waken now as some who saw you then prince as you were and are can testify not only saw but under false allegiance laid hands upon 
I, to my shame. And I, who, to wipe out that shame, have been the first to stir and lead us hark. Shouts, trumpets, etc. Our forces, sir, challenging King Basilio's, now in sight and bearing down upon us. Sir, you hear a little hesitation and delay, and all is lost, your own right, and the lives of those who now maintain it at that cost, with you all saved and won, without all lost, that former recognition of your right, grant but a dream. If you will have it so, great things forecast themselves by shadows great, or will you have it, this like that dream too, people and place and time itself, all dream yet, being it, and as the shadows come, quicker and thicker than you can escape, adopt your visionary soldiery, who, having struck a solid chain away, now put an airy sword into your hand, and harnessing your piecemeal till you stand, amidst us all complete and glittering, if unsubstantial, steel. Rosora, without. The prince! The prince! Who calls for him? The page who spurred us hither, and now dismounted from a foaming horse. Enter Rosora. Where is, but where I need no further ask, where the majestic presence, all in arms, mutely proclaims and vindicates himself. My darling lady, lord. My own good fife, keep to my side and silence. O oh, my lord, for the third time behold me here, where first you saw me, by a happy misadventure, losing my own way here to find it out, for you to follow with these loyal men, adding the moment of my little cause to yours, which, so much mightier as it is, by a strange chance runs hand in hand with mine, the self-same foe who now pretends your right, withholding mine, that, of itself alone, I know the royal blood that runs in you would vindicate, regardless of your own, the right of injured innocence, and, more, spite of this epicene attire, a woman's, and of a noble stock I will not name, till I who brought it have retrieved the shame whom Duke Astolfo, Prince of Muscovy, with all the solemn vows of wedlock won, and would have wedded, as I do believe, had not a cry of Poland for a prince called him from Muscovy to join the prize of Poland with the fair Estrella's eyes. I, following him hither, as you saw, was cast upon these rocks, arrested by Clotaldo, who, for an old debt of love he owes my family, with all his might served and had served me further, till my cause clashed with his duty to his sovereign, which, as became a loyal subject, sir, and never sovereign had a loyaler, was still his first. He carried me to court, where for the second time I crossed your path, where, as I watched my opportunity, suddenly broke this public passion out, which, drowning private into public wrong, yet swiftlier sweeps it to revenge along. O oh God, if this be dreaming, charge it not to burst the channel of enclosing sleep, and drown the waking reason, not to dream only what dreamt shall once or twice again return to buzz about the sleeping brain, till shaken off for ever, but reassailing one so quick, so thick, the very figure and the circumstance of sense-confessed reality foregone in so-called dreams so palpably repeated, the copy so like the original, we know not which is which, and dream so called, itself in weaving so inextricably into the tissue of acknowledged truth, the very figures that impeople it, returning to assert themselves no phantoms in something so much like meridian day, and in the very place that not my worst and various disenchanter shall deny for the too well-remembered theatre of my long tragedy strike up the drums if this be truth and all of us awake indeed a famous quarrel is at stake if but a vision i will see it out and drive the dream i can but join the rout and in good time sir for a palpable touchstone of truth and rightful vengeance too here is Clotaldo, taken. In with him! In with the traitor! 
Clotaldo brought in. Aye, Clotaldo indeed, himself in his old habit, his old self. What, back again, Clotaldo, for a while to swear me this for truth, and afterwards all for a dreaming lie? Awake or dreaming, down with that sword, and down these treasures theirs, drawn in rebellion gainst their sovereign. Sigismund, about to strike. Traitor, traitor yourself, but soft, soft, soft. You told me not so very long ago, awake or dreaming, I forget, my brain is not so clear about it, but I know one test you gave me to discern between, which mad and dreaming people cannot master. Or, if the dreamer could, so best secure a comfortable waking. Was't not so? To Rosora. Needs not your intercession now, you see, as in the dream before. Clotaldo, rough old nurse and tutor too, that only traitor wert to me if true. Give him his sword, set him on a fresh horse, conduct him safely through my rebel force, and so God speed him to his sovereign's side. Give me your hand, and whether all awake or all a-dreaming, ride, Clotaldo, ride, dream swift, for fear we dreams should overtake. A battle may be supposed to take place. End of Act Three Act Four of Life is a Dream by Pedro Calderón de la Barca Translated by Edward Fitzgerald, 1809-1883 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Act Four Scene One A wooded pass near the field of battle. Drums trumpets, firing, etc., cries of, God save Basilio, Sigismund, etc. Enter Fife, running. God save them both, and save them all, say I. Oh, what hot work, whichever way one turns, the whistling bullet at one's ears I have drifted, far from my mad young master, whom I saw tossing upon the very crest of battle beside the prince god save her first of all with all my heart i say and pray and so commend her to his keeping bang 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 and for myself scarce worth this thinking of i see what i can do to save myself behind this rock until the storm blows over. Skirmishes, shouts, firing, etc. After some time, enter King Basilio, Astolfo, and Clotaldo. The day is lost. Do not despair. The rebels. Alas, the vanquished only are the rebels. Even if this battle lost us, tis but one gained on their side if you not lost in it. Another moment and too late at once take horse and to the capital my liege where in some safe and holy sanctuary save poland in your person be persuaded you know your son have tasted of his temper at his first onset threatening unprovoked the crime predicted for his last and worst how wetted now with such a taste of blood and thus far conquest ay and how he fought oh how he fought astolfo ranks of men falling as swathes of grass before the mower i could but pause to gaze on him although like the pale horseman of the apocalypse each moment brought him nearer yet i say i could but pause and gaze on him and pray poland had such a warrior for her king the cry of triumph on the other side gains ground upon us here there's but a moment for you, my liege, to do, for me to speak, who back must to the field, and what man may do to retrieve the fortune of the day. Firing. Fife, falling forward, shot. O oh, Lord, have mercy on me. What a shriek! Oh, some poor creature wounded in a cause, perhaps not worth the loss of one poor life. So young, too, and no soldier. 
a poor lad was choosing play at hide and seek with death just hid where death just came to look for him for there's no place i think can keep him out once he's his eye upon him all grows dark you glitter finely too well we are dreaming but when the bullet's off heaven save the mark so tell my mister mistress dies o oh god how this poor creature's ignorance confounds our so-called wisdom even now when death has stopped his lips the wound through which his soul went out still with its bloody tongue preaching how vain our struggle against fate voices within after, after them after them, after them. them. this way this, this way. way this, this way. way the day is ours the day is down, down with basilio down with basilio fly sir and slave like fly not outride the fate which better like a king abide enter sigismund rosora soldiers etc where is the king king basilio prostrating himself behold him by this late anticipation of resistless fate thus underneath your feet his golden crown and the white head that wears it laying down his fond resistance hope to expiate princes and warriors of poland you that stare on this unnatural sight aghast listen to one who heaven inspired to do what in its secret wisdom heaven forecast by that same heaven instructed prophet wise to justify the present in the past what in the sapphire volume of the skies is writ by god's own finger misleads none but him whose vain and misinstructed eyes they mock with misinterpretation or who mistaking what he rightly read ill commentary makes or misapplies thinking to shirk or thwart it which has done the wisdom of this venerable head who well provided with the secret key to that gold alphabet himself made me himself i say the savage he forread fate somehow should be charged with nip the growth of better nature in constraint and sloth that only bring to bear the seed of wrong and turn the stream to fury whose outburst had kept his lawful channel uncoerced and fertilized the land he flowed along then like to some unskilful duelist who having overreached himself pushing too hard his foe or but a moment off his guard what odds when fate is one's antagonist nay more this royal father self dismayed at having fate against himself arrayed upon himself the very sword he knew should wound him down upon his bosom drew that might well handled well have wrought or kept undrawn have harmless in the scabbard slept but fate shall not by human force be broke nor foiled by human faint the secret learned against the scholar by that master turned who to himself reserves the master stroke witness whereof this venerable age thrice crowned as sire and sovereign and sage down to the very dust dishonored by the very means he tempted to defy the irresistible and shall not i till now the mere dumb instrument that wrought the battle fate has with my father fought now the mere mouthpiece of its victory oh shall not i the champion's sword lay down be yet more shamed to wear the teacher's gown and blushing at the part i had to play down where that honoured head i was to lay by this more just submission of my own the treason fate has forced on me a tone o oh, sigismund in whom i see indeed out of the ashes of my self-extinction a better self revive if not beneath your feet beneath your better wisdom bowed the sovereignty of poland i resign with this is a golden symbol which if thus saved with its silver head in violet shall never more be subject to decline but when the head that it alights on now falls honoured by the very foe that must as all things mortal lay it in the dust shall star-like shift to his successor's brow shouts trumpets etc 
God, God save, save King Sigismund. Sigismund! For what remains, as for my own, so for my people's peace. Astolfo's and Estrella's plighted hands I disunite, and taking hers to mine, his to one yet more dearly his, resign. Shouts, etc. God, God save Estrella, Estrella queen, queen of, of Poland. Poland! Sigismund to Clotaldo. You, that with unflinching duty to your king, till countermanded by the mightier power, have held your prince a captive in the tower. Henceforth, as strictly guard him on the throne, no less my people's keeper than my own. You stare upon me all, amazed to hear the word of civil justice from such lips as never yet seemed tuned to such discourse. But listen, in that same enchanted tower, not long ago I learned it from a dream, expounded by this ancient prophet here, and which he told me, should it come again, how I should bear myself beneath it, not as then with angry passion all on fire, arguing and making a distempered soul, but even with justice, mercy, self-control, as if the dream I walked in were no dream, and conscious one day to account for it. A dream it was in which I thought myself, and you that hailed me now then hailed me king, in a brave palace that was all my own, within and all without it mine, until, drunk with excess of majesty and pride, Methought I towered so high and swelled so wide, that of myself I burst the glittering bubble, that my ambition had about me blown, and all again was darkness. Such a dream as this in which I may be walking now, dispensing solemn justice to you shadows, who make believe to listen. But anon, with all your glittering arms and equipage, king, princes, captains, warriors, plume and steel, I, even with all your airy theatre, may flit into the air you seem to rend with acclamation, leaving me to wake in the dark tower, or dreaming that I wake from this that waking is, or this and that both waking or both dreaming, such a doubt confounds and clouds our mortal life about. And whether wake or dreaming, this I know, how dreamwise human glories come and go, whose momentary tenure not to break, walking as one who knows he soon may wake. So fairly carry the full cup, so well disordered insolence and passion quell, that there be nothing after to upbraid, dreamer or doer in the part he played. Whether tomorrow's dawn shall break the spell, or the last trumpet of the eternal day, when dreaming with the night shall pass away. Excellent. End of Act 4. End of Life is a Dream by Pedro Calderon de la Barca. Translated by Edward Fitzgerald.